Chapter Twenty Four, Section Four of Capital, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Capital, a critical analysis of capitalist production, Volume One by Karl Marx, translated from the third German edition by Samuel Moore and Edward Aveling, and edited by Friedrich Engels. Part Seven, the accumulation of capital, Chapter Twenty Four, conversion of surplus value into capital, Section Four, circumstances that, independently of the proportional division of surplus value into capital and revenue, determine the amount of accumulation, degree of exploitation of labor power, productivity of labor, growing difference in amount between capital employed and capital consumed. Magnitude of capital advanced. The proportion in which surplus value breaks up into capital and revenue being given, the magnitude of the capital accumulated clearly depends on the absolute magnitude of the surplus value. Suppose that eighty per cent were capitalized and twenty per cent eaten up, the accumulated capital will be twenty four hundred pounds or two hundred pounds, according as the total surplus value has amounted to three thousand pounds or five hundred pounds. Hence, all the circumstances that determine the mass of surplus value operate to determine the magnitude of the accumulation. We sum them up once again, but only in so far as they afford new points of view in regard to accumulation. It will be remembered that the rate of surplus value depends, in the first place, on the degree of exploitation of labor power. Political economy values this fact so highly that it occasionally identifies the acceleration of accumulation due to increased productiveness of labor, with its acceleration due to increased exploitation of the laborer. In the chapters on the production of surplus value, it was constantly presupposed that wages are at least equal to the value of labor power. Forcible reduction of wages below this value plays, however, in practice, too important a part for us not to pause upon it for a moment. It in turn transforms within certain limits the laborer's necessary consumption fund into a fund for the accumulation of capital. Footnote: Ricardo says, in different stages of society, the accumulation of capital or of the means of employing, i.e., exploiting, labor is more or less rapid and must, in all cases, depend on the productive powers of labor. The productive powers of labor are generally greatest where there is an abundance of fertile land. If in the first sentence the productive powers of labor mean the smallness of that aliquot part of any produce that goes to those whose manual labor produced it, the sentence is nearly identical, because the remaining aliquot part is the fund whence capital can, if the owner pleases, be accumulated. But then this does not generally happen where there is most fertile land. Observations on certain verbal disputes, etc., pages seventy-four and seventy-five, and note. Wages, says John Stuart Mill, have no productive power; they are the price of a productive power. Wages do not contribute, along with labor, to the production of commodities, no more than the price of tools contributes, along with the tools themselves. If labor could be had without purchase, wages might be dispensed with. Footnote: John Stuart Mill, Essays on some unsettled questions of political economy, London, 1844, page 90. End note. But if the laborers could live on air, they could not be bought at any price. The zero of their cost is therefore a limit in a mathematical sense, always beyond reach, although we can always approximate more and more nearly to it. The constant tendency of capital is to force the cost of labor back towards this zero. A writer of the eighteenth century, often quoted already, the author of the essay on trade and commerce, only betrays the innermost secret soul of English capitalism. When he declares the historic mission of England to be the forcing down of English wages to the level of the French and the Dutch, footnote, an essay on trade and commerce, London, seventeen seventy, page forty four, the Times of December eighteen sixty six and January eighteen sixty seven, in like manner publish certain outpourings of the heart of the English mine owner, in which the happy lot of the Belgian miners was pictured. Who asked and received no more than was strictly necessary for them to live for their masters. The Belgian laborers have to suffer much, but to figure in the Times as model laborers, 
In the beginning of February 1867 came the answer, strike of the Belgian miners at Marchienne, put down by powder and lead. End note. With other things, he says naively, but if our poor, technical term for laborers, will live luxuriously, then labor must, of course, be dear. When it is considered what luxuries the manufacturing populace consume, such as brandy, gin, tea, sugar, foreign fruit, strong beer, printed linens, snuff, tobacco, etc. First C, pages 44 and 46. He quotes the work of a Northamptonshire manufacturer, who, with eyes squinting heavenwards, moans, Labor is one-third cheaper in France than in England, for their poor work hard and fare hard, as to their food and clothing. Their chief diet is bread, fruit, herbs, roots, and dried fish, for they very seldom eat flesh, and when wheat is dear, they eat very little bread. To which may be added, our essayist goes on, that their drink is either water or other small liquors, so that they spend very little money. These things are very difficult to be brought about, but they are not impracticable, since they have been effected both in France and in Holland. Footnote. The Northamptonshire manufacturer commits a pious fraud, pardonable in one whose heart is so full. He nominally compares the life of the English and French manufacturing laborer, but in the words just quoted he is painting, as he himself confesses in his confused way, the French agricultural laborers. End note. Note. First C, pages 70 and 71. Note in the third German edition. Today, thanks to the competition on the world market, established since then, we have advanced much further. If China, says Mr. Stapleton, M.P., to his constituents, should become a great manufacturing country, I do not see how the manufacturing population of Europe could sustain the contest without descending to the level of their competitors. Times, September 3, 1873, page 8. The wished-for goal of English capital is no longer continental wages, but Chinese. End note. Twenty years later, an American humbug, the baronized Yankee, Benjamin Thompson, alias Count Rumford, followed the same line of philanthropy to the great satisfaction of God and man. His essays are a cookery book with receipts of all kinds for replacing, by some succedaneum, the ordinary dear food of the laborer. The following is a particularly successful receipt of this wonderful philosopher. Five pounds of barley meal, seven and a half pence. Five pounds of Indian corn, six and one quarter pence. Three pence worth of red herring, one pence salt, one pence vinegar, two pence pepper and sweet herbs, in all thirty and three quarter pence. Make a soup for sixty-four men, and at the medium price of barley and of Indian corn, this soup may be provided at one quarter pence, the portion of twenty ounces. Footnote. Benjamin Thompson, Essays Political, Economical, and Philosophical, etc., three volumes, London, 1796 to 1802, volume 1, page 294. In his State of the Poor, or An History of the Laboring Classes in England, etc., Sir F. M. Eden strongly recommends the Rumfordian beggar soup to workhouse overseers, and reproachfully warns the English laborers that many poor people, particularly in Scotland, live, and that very comfortably, for months together, upon oatmeal and barley meal, mixed with only water and salt. Volume 1, Book 1, Chapter 2, page 503. The same sorts of hints in the nineteenth century, the most wholesome mixtures of flour having been refused by the English agricultural laborer, in Scotland, where education is better, this prejudice is probably unknown. Charles H. Perry, M.D., The Question of the Necessity of the Existing Corn Laws Considered, London, 1816, page 69. This same Perry, however, complains that the English laborer is now, 1815, in a much worse condition than in Eden's time, 1797. End note. With the advance of capitalistic production, the adulteration of food rendered Thompson's ideal superfluous. Footnote. From the reports of the last Parliamentary Commission on Adulteration of the Means of Subsistence, it will be seen that the adulteration even of medicines is the rule, not the exception, in England. For example, the examination of thirty-four specimens of opium, 
purchased of as many different chemists in London, showed that thirty-one were adulterated with poppy heads, wheat flour, gum, clay, sand, etc. Several did not contain an atom of morphia. End note. At the end of the eighteenth and during the first ten years of the nineteenth century, the English farmers and landlords enforced the absolute minimum of wage, by paying the agricultural laborers less than the minimum in the form of wages, and the remainder in the shape of parochial relief. An example of the waggish way in which the English dogberries acted in their legal fixing of a wages tariff. The squires of Norfolk had dined, says Mr. Burke, when they fixed the rate of wages. The squires of Burke's evidently thought the laborers ought not to do so when they fixed the rate of wages at Spenumland, 1795. There they decided that income, weekly, should be three shillings for a man, when the gallon or half-peck loaf of eight pounds eleven ounces is at one shilling, and increase regularly till bread is one shilling five pence, when it is above that sum decrease regularly till it be at two shillings, and then his food should be one-fifth less. Footnote. G. B. Newnham, Barrister at Law. A Review of the Evidence Before the Committee of the Two Houses of Parliament on the Corn Laws. London, 1815, page 20. End note. Before the Committee of Inquiry of the House of Lords, 1814, a certain A. Bennett, large farmer, magistrate, poor law guardian, and wage regulator, was asked, has any proportion of the value of daily labor been made up to laborers out of the poor's rate? Answer, yes, it has. The weekly income of every family is made up to the gallon loaf, eight pounds, eleven ounces, and three pence per head. The gallon loaf per week is what we suppose sufficient for the maintenance of every person in the family for the week, and the three pence is for clothes, and if the parish think proper to find clothes, the three pence is deducted. This practice goes through all the western part of Wiltshire, and, I believe, throughout the country. For years, exclaims a bourgeois author of that time, they, the farmers, have degraded a respectable class of their countrymen by forcing them to have recourse to the workhouse. The farmer, while increasing his own gains, has prevented any accumulation on the part of his laboring dependents. Footnote. First C, pages 19 and 20. End note. Footnote. C. H. Perry, pages 77, 69. The landlords, on their side, not only indemnified themselves for the anti-Jacobin war, which they waged in the name of England, but enriched themselves enormously. Their rents doubled, trebled, quadrupled, and in one instance increased sixfold in eighteen years. Pages 100, 101. End note. The part played in our days by the direct robbery from the laborer's necessary consumption fund in the formation of surplus value, and therefore of the accumulation fund of capital, the so-called domestic industry has served to show, Chapter 15, Section 8. Further facts on this subject will be given later. Although in all branches of industry that part of the constant capital consisting of instruments of labor must be sufficient, for a certain number of laborers, determined by the magnitude of the undertaking, it by no means always necessarily increases in the same proportion as the quantity of labor employed. In a factory, suppose that one hundred laborers working eight hours a day yield eight hundred working hours. If the capitalist wishes to raise this sum by one-half, he can employ fifty more workers, but then he must also advance more capital, not merely for wages, but for instruments of labor. But he might also let the one hundred laborers work twelve hours instead of eight, and then the instruments of labor all ready to hand would be enough. These would then simply be more rapidly consumed. Thus additional labor, begotten of the greater tension of labor power, can augment surplus product and surplus value, i.e., the subject matter of accumulation, without corresponding augmentation in the constant part of capital. In the extractive industries, mines, etc., the raw materials form no part of the capital advanced. The subject of labor is, in this case, not a product of previous labor, but is furnished by nature gratis, as in the case of metals, minerals, coal, stone, etc. In these cases the constant capital consists almost exclusively of instruments of labor, 
which can very well absorb an increased quantity of labor, day and night shifts of laborers, for example. All other things being equal, the mass and value of the product will rise in direct proportion to the labor expended. As on the first day of production, the original produce farmers, now turned into the creatures of the material elements of capital, man and nature, still work together. Thanks to the elasticity of labor power, the domain of accumulation has extended without any previous enlargement of constant capital. In agriculture the land under cultivation cannot be increased without the advance of more seed and manure. But this advance once made, the purely mechanical working of the soil itself produces a marvelous effect on the amount of the product. A greater quantity of labor, done by the same number of laborers as before, thus increases the fertility, without requiring any new advance in the instrument of labor. It is once again the direct action of man on nature which becomes an immediate source of greater accumulation, without the intervention of any new capital. Finally, in what is called manufacturing industry, every additional expense of labor presupposes a corresponding additional expenditure of raw materials, but not necessarily of instruments of labor. And as extractive industry and agriculture supply manufacturing industry with its raw materials and those of its instruments of labor, the additional product the former have created without additional advance of capital tells also in favor of the latter. General Result By incorporating with itself the two primary creators of wealth, labor power and the land, capital acquires a power of expansion that permits it to augment the elements of its accumulation beyond the limits apparently fixed by its own magnitude, or by the value and the mass of the means of production, already produced, in which it has its being. Another important factor in the accumulation of capital is the degree of productivity of social labor. With the productive power of labor increases the mass of the products, in which a certain value, and therefore a surplus value of a given magnitude, is embodied. The rate of surplus value remaining the same, or even falling, so long as it only falls more slowly than the productive power of labor rises, the mass of the surplus product increases. The division of this product into revenue and additional capital remaining the same, the consumption of the capitalist may, therefore, increase without any decrease in the fund of accumulation. The relative magnitude of the accumulation fund may even increase at the expense of the consumption fund, whilst the cheapening of commodities places at the disposal of the capitalist as many means of enjoyment as formerly, or even more than formerly. But hand in hand with the increasing productivity of labor goes, as we have seen, the cheapening of the laborer, therefore a higher rate of surplus value, even when the real wages are rising. The latter never rise proportionally to the productive power of labor. The same value and variable capital, therefore, sets in movement more labor power, and therefore more labor. The same value in constant capital is embodied in more means of production, i.e., in more instruments of labor, materials of labor, and auxiliary materials. It therefore also supplies more elements for the production both of use value and of value, and with these more absorbers of labor. The value of the additional capital, therefore, remaining the same or even diminishing, accelerated accumulation still takes place. Not only does the scale of reproduction materially extend, but the production of surplus value increases more rapidly than the value of the additional capital. The development of the productive power of labor reacts also on the original capacity already engaged in the process of production. A part of the functioning constant capital consists of instruments of labor, such as machinery, etc., which are not consumed, and therefore not reproduced, or replaced by new ones of the same kind, until after long periods of time. But every year a part of these instruments of labor perishes or reaches the limit of its productive function. It reaches, therefore, in that year, the time for its periodical reproduction, for its replacement by new ones of the same kind. If the productiveness of labor has, during the using up of these instruments of labor, increased, and it develops continually with the uninterrupted advance of science and technology, more efficient and, considering their increased efficiency, cheaper machines, tools, apparatus, etc., replace the old. 
the old capital is reproduced in a more productive form, apart from the constant detail improvements in the instruments of labor already in use. The other part of the constant capital, raw material and auxiliary substances, is constantly reproduced in less than a year, those produced by agriculture for the most part annually. Every introduction of improved methods, therefore, works almost simultaneously on the new capital and on that already in action. Every advance in chemistry not only multiplies the number of useful materials and the useful applications of those already known, thus extending with the growth of capital its sphere of investment. It teaches at the same time how to throw the excrements of the processes of production and consumption back again into the circle of the process of reproduction, and, thus, without any previous outlay of capital, creates new matter for capital. Like the increased exploitation of natural wealth by the mere increase in the tension of labor power, science and technology give capital a power of expansion independent of the given magnitude of the capital already functioning. They react at the same time on that part of the original capital which has entered upon its stage of renewal. Thus, in passing into its new shape, incorporates gratis the social advance made while its old shape was being used up. Of course, this development of productive power is accompanied by a partial depreciation of functioning capital. So far as this depreciation makes itself acutely felt in competition, the burden falls on the laborer, in the increased exploitation of whom the capitalist looks for his indemnification. Labor transmits to its product the value of the means of production consumed by it. On the other hand, the value and mass of the means of production set in motion by a given quantity of labor increase as the labor becomes more productive. Though the same quantity of labor adds always to its products only the sum of new value, still the old capital value, transmitted by the labor to the products, increases with the growing productivity of labor. An English and a Chinese spinner, for example, may work the same number of hours with the same intensity, then they will both in a week create equal values. But in spite of this equality, an immense difference will obtain between the value of the week's product of the Englishman, who works with a mighty automaton, and that of the Chinaman, who has but a spinning wheel. In the same time as the Chinaman spins one pound of cotton, the Englishman spins several hundreds of pounds. A sum many hundred times as great of old value swells the value of his product, in which those reappear in a new useful form, and can thus function as new capital. In 1782, as Friedrich Engels teaches us, all the wool crop in England of the three preceding years lay untouched for want of laborers, and so it must have lain if newly invented machinery had not come to its aid and spun it. Footnote. Friedrich Engels Lage der Arbeitenden Klasse in England, page 20. End note. Labor embodied in the form of machinery, of course, did not directly force into life a single man, but it made possible for a smaller number of laborers, with the addition of relatively less living labor, not only to consume the wool productively and to put into it new value, but to preserve in the form of yarn, etc., its old value. At the same time, it caused and stimulated increased reproduction of wool. It is the natural property of living labor to transmit old value whilst it creates new. Hence, with the increase in efficacy, extent and value of its means of production, consequently with the accumulation that accompanies the development of its productive power, labor keeps up and eternizes an always increasing capital value in a form ever new. This natural power of labor takes the appearance of an intrinsic property of capital, in which it is incorporated, just as the productive forces of social labor take the appearance of inherent properties of capital, and as the constant appropriation of surplus labor by the capitalists takes that of a constant self-expansion of capital. Footnote. Classic economy has, on account of a deficient analysis of the labor process and of the process of creating value, never properly grasped this weighty element of reproduction, as may be seen in Ricardo. He says, for example, whatever the change in productive power, a million men always produce in manufactures the same value. This is accurate if the extension and degree of intensity of their labor are given. But it does not prevent, this Ricardo overlooks in certain conclusions he draws, 
a million men with different powers of productivity in their labor, turning into products very different masses of the means of production, and therefore preserving in their products very different masses of value, in consequence of which the values of the products yielded may vary considerably. Ricardo has, it may be noted in passing, tried in vain to make clear to J. B. Say, by that very example, the difference between use-value, which he here calls wealth or material riches, and exchange-value. Say answers, as for the difficulty raised by Ricardo when he says that, by using better methods of production, a million people can produce two or three times as much wealth, without producing any more value, this difficulty disappears when one bears in mind, as one should, that production is like an exchange, in which a man contributes the productive services of his labor, his land, and his capital, in order to obtain products. It is by means of these productive services that we acquire all the products existing in the world. Therefore we are richer, our productive services have the more value, the greater quantity of useful things than they bring through the exchange which is called production. J. B. Say, Lettres à M. Malthus, Paris, 1820, pages 168 and 169. The difficulty, it exists for him, not for Ricardo, that Say means to clear up is this. Why does not the exchange value of the use value increase, when their quantity increases in consequence of increased productive power of labor? Answer. The difficulty is met by calling use value exchange value, if you please. Exchange value is a thing that is connected one way or another with exchange. If, therefore, production is called an exchange of labor and means of production against the product, it is clear as day that you obtain more exchange value in proportion as the production yields more use value. In other words, the more use values, i.e., stockings, a working day yields to the stocking manufacturer, the richer he is in stockings. Suddenly, however, Say recollects with a great quantity of stockings their price, which of course has nothing to do with their exchange value, falls, because competition obliges them, the producers, to sell their products for what they cost to make. But whence does the profit come if the capitalist sells the commodities at cost price? Never mind, Say declares that, in consequence of increased productivity, Every one now receives, in return for a given equivalent, two pairs of stockings instead of one as before. The result he arrives at is precisely that proposition of Ricardo that he aimed at disproving. After this mighty effort of thought, he triumphantly apostrophizes Malthus in the words, This, sir, is the well-founded doctrine without which it is impossible, I say, to explain the greatest difficulties in political economy and in particular to explain why it is that a nation can be richer when its products fall in value, even though wealth is value. First see page 170. An English economist remarks upon the conjuring tricks of the same nature that appear in Say's letters. Those affected ways of talking make up in general that which M. Say is pleased to call his doctrine, and which he earnestly urges Malthus to teach at Hartford as it is already taught in numerous parts of Europe. He says, if all those propositions appear paradoxical to you, look at the things they express, and I venture to believe that they will then appear very simple and very rational. Doubtless, and in consequence of the same process, they will appear everything else except original. An inquiry into those principles respecting the nature of demand, etc., pages 116 and 110. End note. With the increase of capital, the difference between the capital employed and the capital consumed increases. In other words, there is increase in the value and the material mass of the instruments of labor, such as buildings, machinery, drain pipes, working cattle, apparatus of every kind that function for a longer or shorter time in process of production constantly repeated, or that serve for the attainment of particular useful effects, whilst they themselves only gradually wear out therefore only lose their value piecemeal, therefore transfer that value to the product only bit by bit. In the same proportion as these instruments of labor serve as product formers without adding value to the product, i.e., in the same proportion as they are wholly employed, but only partly consumed, they perform, as we saw earlier, the same gratuitous service as the natural forces, water, steam, air, electricity, etc. This gratuitous service of past labor when seized and filled with the soul by living labor, increases with the advancing stages of accumulation. 
Since past labor always disguises itself as capital, i.e., since the passive of the labor of A, B, C, takes the form of the active of non-laborer X, bourgeois and political economists are full of praises of the services of dead-and-gone labor, which, according to the Scotch genius McCullough, ought to receive a special remuneration in the shape of interest, profit, etc. The powerful and ever-increasing assistance given by past labor to the living labor process under the form of means of production is, therefore, attributed to that form of past labor in which it is alienated, as unpaid labor, from the worker himself, i.e., to its capitalistic form. The practical agents of capitalist production and their pettifogging ideologists are as unable to think of the means of production as separate from the antagonistic social mask they wear today as a slave owner to think of the worker himself as distinct from his character as a slave. Footnote. McCulloch took out a patent for wages of past labor long before Senior did for wages of abstinence. End note. With a given degree of exploitation of labor power, the mass of the surplus value produced is determined by the number of workers simultaneously exploited, and this corresponds, although in varying proportions, with the magnitude of capital. The more, therefore, capital increases by means of successive accumulations, the more does the sum of the value increase that is divided into the consumption fund and accumulation fund. The capitalist can, therefore, live a more jolly life, and at the same time show more abstinence. And, finally, all the springs of production act with greater elasticity, the more its scale extends with the mass of the capital advanced. End of chapter 24, section 4